hear you, but I can't see you on screen at the moment. But we, I think that will be adjusted. Is that something at the other end or at this end? Uh, we no, can we now. can see you now. Can you see us? Yep. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Stewart. Um, thank you, Your Honour. As um, Your Honour is aware, the witness this morning is Mr. Jeffrey Jackson. Uh, there is an appearance to be uh, noted on his behalf. Could I announce my appearance on behalf of Mr. Jackson Bannon? Sorry, um, Mr. Bannon. Yes. Yes, you have leave. Thank you, Mr. Right. Jackson, you need to be sworn. You have yes, a, Your Honour. Do you have a Bible there? I certainly do. Would you take the Bible in your hand, please, and repeat after me? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Yes, thank you. Take a seat again, please. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Stewart. As Your Honour pleases. Uh, Mr. Jackson, will you state your full names and your work address, please? Yes, my name is Geoffrey William Jackson, and I work at 25 Columbia Heights. Uh, but the mailing address is 124 Columbia Heights, Brooklyn, New York. Mr. Jackson, I understand you were born in Queensland, Australia in 1955, is that right? Uh, that is correct. And you were baptised as a Jehovah's Witness in Queensland in 1968? That is correct. Uh, and you left school at the age of 15 and commenced pioneering work for the Jehovah's Witnesses in Tasmania, is that right? Uh, that is correct. And thereafter you fulfilled various roles as translator and then branch committee member, first in Fiji and then in Samoa. Uh, if I could correct you, Mr. Stewart, please. Uh, first of all in Samoa and then in Fiji. Thank you. And. As I understand it, in 2003, you were transferred to the translation services uh, in New York. Is that right? Uh, yes, in the state of New York, but in the educational facility of Jehovah's Witnesses upstate in Patterson. And in September 2005, you were appointed as a member of the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses. That is correct. And as I understand it, you've served continuously in that capacity since then. Uh, that is correct as well. And on the governing body, I understand that you are a member of both the writing and the teaching committees, is that right? Uh, if I may be allowed to explain, each governing body member has a home committee uh, where his office is based. So in my case, uh, I work in the writing department under the writing uh, committee, uh, but then also I have the role of a consultant uh, with the teaching committee as well as the personnel committee. But I do serve on the teaching and personnel committees. Yes, so as I understand it, you serve on the writing, teaching and personnel committees, is that right? That is correct. And could you just briefly explain what it means to be a consultant uh, on one of the committees? Uh, yes. Uh, with regard to my role, uh, each member of the governing body, of course there are seven at the moment, uh, each brings something to the table with regard to our expertise. Uh, my field is translation, and as you realize and have mentioned, it has been for quite some time. But also, obviously, I was appointed on the governing body because of my spiritual qualifications. Uh, so my role as a consultant with the teaching committee and personnel committee involves me evaluating recommendations that are made uh, to see if, first of all, they are scripturally accurate and correct, and secondly, whether they're translatable. So would that be with regard to all 
business and decisions of the committees on which you serve, you would fulfill that function you've just described? That is the function that I uh, fulfill. So in other words, to <clears throat> give guidance and ensure that the decisions at work, <clears throat> excuse me, of those committees are scripturally accurate uh, and correct. Uh, as well as translatable. And by translatable, do you mean translatable into various languages of the world? Yes, uh, just uh, to, you probably are aware of the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses uh, translate their material into nearly 900 languages. I think it's something like 893 translation teams we have. And our magazine, The Watchtower, uh, is translated in approximately 250 languages. So at times, uh, these committees need my input with regard to how things will be translated uh, in other languages. But as I understand it, your input on those committees is not restricted to the question of translation. It would cover all the business of those committees, is that right? Uh, it covers all the business in the aspect of me analyzing the scriptural basis for decisions. Now, could you explain, Mr. Jackson, the committee structure and how it relates to the governing body, which is to say, do the do the committees report to, and are they accountable to the governing body as a whole, or how does it work? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Stewart. Yes, uh, the governing body, as I mentioned, has seven members. Uh, as you would realize, with 8.2 million active members of Jehovah's Witnesses, with approximately 20 million associated with us, there is no way that the seven members of the governing body can be up to date with all aspects of every part of our work. So the governing body uh, is broken up into various committees. Uh, the committees, uh, there's a measure of trust, obviously, because the men who are appointed on those committees uh, understand something about the operation of those various aspects. But if I may also mention something I think the Commission hasn't noticed is that there are a role of 30 helpers, and these helpers join us in our, not the governing body committee, but the various subcommittees. And uh, they help us by making recommendations and implementing the policies. Yes, thank you, Mr. Jackson. Is it uh, the case that the helpers also attend the governing body meetings that occur weekly but don't... Uh, make decisions there? Uh, no, they don't normally attend the one meeting the governing body has each Wednesday, uh, unless, of course, uh, we need some special input from one of them or from several, and then they may be invited as needed. But you're correct in saying they do not vote. And so is it right to say that the committees then are accountable to the governing body? Uh, there is a, uh, yes, ultimately the governing body oversees the work of the committees, but there is a, a measure of trust, obviously, uh, that uh, goes on. Uh, maybe if I could use an example, I would be the last person on earth to ask with regard to construction details, but the publishing committee uh, handles our construction uh, worldwide, and uh, so those that have more familiarity with that type of expertise uh, we would trust them uh, to go ahead with most of the decisions. Now, you've said that the governing body presently has seven members. Uh, is it... Uh, I withdraw that. How is it determined how many members there will be from time to time? Uh, there can be any number of members on the governing body. Uh, in the past um, few decades, uh, for example, when I was appointed on the governing body, uh, there were 12 of us. I believe the number has been 18 at one stage. Uh, but the qualifications uh, of a member for the governing body involves someone who is considered an anointed witness, uh, who has worked uh, in scriptural, uh, with a scriptural background, either as a missionary or a full-time servant for many years, and is able to fulfill the role of the governing body, which is, and may I state, uh, 
a, a group, a spiritual group of men who are the guardians of our doctrine. And as guardians of the doctrine, uh, look at things that need to be decided based on our doctrines, which are based on the constitution of the Bible. And I take it if the governing body is to be increased in size, that that will be a decision of the governing body itself. Uh, that is correct. But obviously we would get information from other fields. And is it the case that the governing body then appoints new members of the governing body? Uh, that is correct. And does someone have a designated role such as coordinator or chairperson or president? Uh, you mean of the governing body? Yes. Or do you mean the subcommittees? No, I mean of the governing body. Uh, yes, uh, we rotate uh, each year. Uh, there's a chairman of the governing body, but the chairman's role is merely to chair the meetings. And so there's no one who has um, a permanent role of coordination or designation such as president or, or what have you? Uh, that is correct. Only the, under, the committees uh, under the direction of the governing body have a coordinator for each committee. Now, dealing with decisions of the governing body uh, itself, how are decisions made, by which I mean, uh, are they made only by consensus or, major or by majority, or is there some other system you adopt? Um, <clears throat> so, if a policy or a, a question comes up with regard to doctrine or something that involves uh, our biblical stand, uh, we will uh, allow someone to come in and uh, present to us uh, all the uh, facts concerning that. Obviously, the seven involved cannot be familiar with every aspect that we need to consider. So once the uh, proposal has been given to the governing body, it's an agenda point. Ahead of time, each governing body member, uh, with prayer, by means of prayer and reading the Bible, uh, then tries to see how the Bible would affect any particular decision. <laughs> Uh, so then in our discussion, uh, generally from my experience, which has only just been the last uh, 10 years, uh, in most cases it's unanimous. And if it's not, uh, then it would be carried by majority, etc.? Uh, that is the, the case, but as I said, it's a rare thing because if someone, perhaps their conscience is not uh, uh, clear or, or feel comfortable with a certain decision, then more often than not, we would uh, rely upon God's spirit by uh, holding up on making a final decision until more research is done. And then we would meet again. And by what mechanism would you understand uh, God's spirit to direct your decisions? Uh, well, what I mean by that is by prayer and using our constitution, uh, God's word, uh, we would go through the scriptures and see if there was any biblical principle at all that would influence our decision. And it could be that uh, in our initial discussions there was something that uh, maybe we were missing and uh, then in another discussion that would come to light. So we would view that as uh, God's spirit motivating us by because we believe the Bible is God's word and came by means of Holy Spirit. And your reference to your constitution, <clears throat> I understand by the way in which you raised the Bible as you said that, you're referring to the Bible. The Bible is our constitution, yes. Now the governing body is in the literature referred to as the faithful and discreet slave. Uh, can you briefly explain what that means? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, the scripture, Your Honor, if I may uh, use my Bible, yes, uh, I would right. like to turn to, yes, thank you, uh, to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, now, Mr. Stewart, perhaps I could give you the page number to make it a little quicker. Well, I'm on it already, uh, Matthew Mr. Jackson. 24. Oh, very good. So, Matthew 24, verses 45 and 46. And this 
is how the governing body views their role, what they try to do. Uh, there it says, who really is the faithful and discreet slave for whom his master appointed over his, dis uh, sorry, uh, whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time. Happy is that slave if his master on coming finds him doing so. So the, the goal of the governing body as custodians of our doctrine is to publish literature uh, that helps people in everyday life using what the Bible says. And if I may just add a second scripture, which I feel is very important, is the one found in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 6 is page 1468, uh, Mr. Stewart. Uh, 1468, Acts chapter 6. And uh, here we have perhaps something that the commission is more interested in rather than just our overall spiritual teachings. We have a situation in the first century where there was a practical problem where the Greek-speaking widows were not receiving food uh, from the arrangement that was in place. So the apostles at that point uh, were asked to try and sort out this problem. And you notice that in verse 3 and 4, it says, So brothers, select for yourselves seven reputable men from among you, full of spirit and wisdom, that we may appoint them over this necessary matter, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So verse 4 describes the role of the governing body as we see it, to devote ourselves to prayer and the word of God. And uh, that's why 30 helpers have been assigned that are involved more with the practical side of policy and implementation. Uh, do correct me, Mr. Jackson, if I <clears throat> misunderstand this, but this does seem to me to suggest in the use of the words, brothers, select for yourselves seven reputable men, that a broader congregation uh, of uh, believers would make the selection rather than uh, the seven themselves. Uh, well, this is one of the difficulties we have when a secular commission is trying to analyze a religious subject. Uh, I you know, humbly would like to mention that point. Uh, our understanding of the scriptures is these ones were appointed by means of the apostles. Uh, your point is well taken. Uh, let's assume hypothetically that others selected these seven men, but it was at the direction of the, uh, the apostles. And do you, as members of the governing body, regard yourselves as being appointed by Jehovah God or uh, under the capacity or authority of Jehovah God? Uh, what we view ourselves as fellow workers with our brothers and sisters, uh, we have been given a responsibility to guard or, or to be guardians of doctrine. Uh, so just the same with elders are referred to as being appointed by Holy Spirit. Uh, as you probably are aware, uh, we believe that means that when an elder is in harmony with what the Bible says is required of an elder, uh, then he is appointed by Holy Spirit. So, where so the same is true with the governing body. So where it's said that the faithful and discreet slave is made up of a small group of anointed brothers. Uh, we to understand that as, as uh, the belief behind that being that you are anointed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, that is correct. But if I could just enlarge on that, uh, there are many anointed Jehovah's Witnesses who do not serve on the governing body. And that would include all the elders around the world. Would that be right? Uh, no, that is not correct. Uh, the anointing process that we are referring to uh, is referred to in the book of uh, Romans chapter 8, where it speaks of the, a heavenly calling. So the majority of Jehovah's Witnesses hope to live in a paradise earth, uh, whereas those who have been selected uh, by means of Holy Spirit uh, have a hope to, to live in heaven, to go to heaven when they die, in other words. And, Mr. Jackson, is, is that the uh, 144,000 that's referred to? 
Uh, ultimately, in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, it refers to the total number being 144,000. Now, does the governing body, or do the members of the governing body, um, do you see yourselves as modern-day disciples, the modern-day equivalent of Jesus' disciples? Uh, we certainly hope to follow Jesus and be his disciples. And do you see yourselves as Jehovah God's spokespeople on earth? Uh, that, I think, would seem to be quite presumptuous to, to say that uh, we are the only spokesperson that God is using. Uh, the, clear, the, the scriptures clearly show uh, that uh, someone can act in harmony with God's Spirit in uh, giving comfort and help in the congregations. But uh, if I could just clarify a little, going back to Matthew 24... Uh, clearly, Jesus said that in the last days, and Jehovah's Witnesses believe these are the last days, there would be a slave, a group of persons who would have responsibility to care for the spiritual food. So in that respect, uh, we view ourselves as trying to fulfill that role. Uh, Mr. Jackson, I'd like to refer you to a document. I believe that there's someone there to assist you. Uh, it's Exhibit 2928, and it's the Branch Organization January 2015 uh, Manual, and particular at uh, Chapter 1. <coughs> Perhaps you can just confirm that you have the opening page of Chapter 1 uh, available to you. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. So in paragraph 1, it says that the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses is made up of brothers who are anointed servants of Jehovah God. I, I take it that is how you see it, and that's in the manner you've explained a few minutes ago. That's correct. And then it said that they have the responsibility for giving direction and impetus to the kingdom work, and some scriptures are given. I take it that is how you see it. Uh, that is correct. And it also then says, like its first century counterpart, the governing body today looks to Jehovah, the universal sovereign, and to Jesus Christ, the head of the congregation, for direction in all matters. Uh, would that be how you see it? Uh, that's correct, yes. And then in paragraph 2... It says in the second sentence, the governing body, uh, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, in the first sentence, the Bible says, with reference to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, let all things take place decently and by arrangement, and that the governing body obeys this direction by putting in place various helpful procedures and guidelines that ensure the smooth and orderly operation of the branch offices and congregations. Now, from that, are we to understand that the procedures and guidelines that are published uh, by the Jehovah's Witnesses, in particular the Watch Tower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania, are the procedures and guidelines referred to here? Um, if I understand your question correctly, uh, Mr. Stewart, uh, if I could just explain... Uh, as it highlights here, uh, there is a responsibility of the governing body. And may I remind you that you're quoting from a publication that is not a constitution, is not a legal document, is not a contract. Uh, it is a, a, an expression of the relationship and responsibilities between the governing body and the branch committee. So in this uh, paragraph, uh, we are highlighting to the branch committees the responsibility that we feel uh, that there is a need, yes, for certain procedures and uh, for certain uh, direction to be given in a spiritual nature. And from the next sentence, responsible Christian men do their part by setting an example of obedience as they put such arrangements into effect. Are we to understand that 
the expectation of the governing body is, is that the branches around the world will uh, act in accordance with those procedures and guidelines. Uh, that is the expectation, but may I put the proviso on this? You see, as the paragraph 2 starts off, the second sentence, the governing body obeys this direction. Uh, Mr. Stewart, what you need to understand with regard to our organization is a faith-driven organization. It, this is uh, not an organization of lawyers or those that are uh, overly concerned with legal matters. So. Our primary allegiance is to Jehovah God. Now, the governing body realizes that if we were to give some direction that is not in harmony with uh, God's word, uh, all of Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide who have the Bible would notice that, and they would see that it was wrong direction. So we have a responsibility as guardians uh, to make sure that everything is scripturally acceptable. So if the direction given is scripturally correct, then we would expect that these members of the branch committee, who themselves also are Christians who accept the Constitution, would follow that direction. But, if I can also say, there are provisions for those branch committees to get back to us. If they see that there's something that doesn't work, uh, and, uh, and then we can adjust it accordingly. Yes, thank you, Mr. Jackson. I'll come to the question of um, <clears throat> adjustments uh, and so on in a moment, but from what you said, am I to understand that the governing body seeks to obey Jehovah God? Absolutely. And that the branches seek to obey the governing body? First of all, the branches seek to obey Jehovah. That's we're all in the same arrangement. Uh, but because they recognize a central body of spiritual men who give spiritual direction, then we would assume that they would follow that direction, or if something is not appropriate, that they would identify that. And in turn, the congregations are expected to obey the branches. Uh, again, first of all, they have to obey Jehovah God. That is the very first thing. Uh, that they need to do. But uh, if direction is given based on the Bible, we would expect that they would follow that because of their respect of the Bible. And the definitive interpretation of the Bible from time to time is the governing body. Is that right? Uh, ultimately, as guardians of, of our doctrine and beliefs, uh, yes, uh, some central group needs to make that decision. But that doesn't mean to say that we, uh, you, uh, just on our own unilaterally, uh, make those decisions without research and input from others. Yes. Um, could I ask you to look now at <clears throat> paragraph 4 on that page? It says, the governing body gives final approval for new publications as well as new audio and video programs. <clears throat> and I understand that comes very much under the... Uh, responsibility of the writing committee, is that right? <clears throat> uh, that is correct. <coughs> and in paragraph five, <clears throat> uh, the governing body cares for the appointment and deletion of branch and country committee members and, de and designates the brother who will serve as the coordinator of the committee, I take it that is the manner in which things are done? That is correct. Now, <clears throat> returning to the question of uh, publications, where it says there in paragraph 4 that the governing body approves publications, does that include uh, the Awake and Watchtower publications? Uh, yes, that does. Uh, but may I explain? You see, we have a proofreading department uh, that obviously reads everything before it's printed, and uh, they are responsible to make sure grammatically everything is correct. Uh, we have compositors who compose the magazines. 
Uh, we, we have a lot of people working on various things. The role of the governing body, and my role as a member of the governing body, is to read each of those publications, looking to see if it does harmonize the scriptures or not. Uh, I have no idea with the Awake magazine, it may be talking about some technical uh, issue that uh, involves uh, areas that I know nothing of. But the main thing for me to read it is, is it translatable? And does it match what the Bible says? And the, are those publications, uh, with all that, do those publications uh, which require approval of the governing body include the manuals such as Shepherd the Flock of God, uh, organized to do Jehovah's work, and this branch organization manual we're looking at? Uh, yes, again, but with the proviso that we do not write those uh, manuals. Uh, those that are involved with that aspect of our work uh, write them. Uh, they do the research that's necessary. Then the governing body finally reads it to make sure not that the policy uh, can work in every aspect, because obviously uh, we're not familiar with all those various a a a aspects of the issue, but to make sure scripturally nothing is wrong. But I take it the governing body takes responsibility for uh, those publications. Uh, we do uh, take spiritual responsibility for it, yes. Uh, may I just mention, if there's a printing mistake uh, and we say that penguins are found in the middle of Australia, uh, then uh, yes, it's true, we take responsibility, but it's uh, without, not within the realms of our expertise. But we would check to see who it was that had given that wrong information. And the publications that are referred to in paragraph 4, would that include the letters to elders or the letters to the bodies of elders around the world? Uh, if it's signed on behalf of the governing body, yes. But there are hundreds of letters that are sent out uh, by service departments that aren't necessarily coming from the governing body. Well, I, I should have been clearer, Mr. Jackson. I'm referring to the um, standard letters to bodies of elders dealing with uh, general matters in a normative way, not particular letters dealing perhaps with a specific issue that's arisen here or there. Uh, true, Mr. Stewart, but uh, it's very rare for a congregation to receive uh, a, a letter from the governing body signed by the, the governing body. Uh, what will happen is a template may be approved of the basic principles and so on, but branches uh, are allowed in many cases to make adjustments according to their local circumstances. Not adjustments to scriptural things, uh, they would need to get back to us on that, but adjustments for local uh, circumstances. Those adjustments themselves, though, are adjustments which require approval uh, of Bethel in New York. Is that not right? Uh, I would to, uh, beg to differ on that uh, with all respect. Uh, sorry, Mr. Stewart, do you need me to stop? No, no, carry on. Okay, uh, you can hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, again, we're talking about a wide range of letters. Uh, letters that are signed by the governing body, yes, definitely. Uh, but letters, uh, policy letters, uh, may, may be adjusted locally. Uh, would it help if I gave you an example? Yes, Mr. Jackson. Uh, so, in many countries in the world, Jehovah's Witnesses, in their preaching work, uh, if they meet someone who is interested uh, in hearing the message, they may note down their particulars and then return and visit them later. But in some countries, uh, that is not a legal thing that you're allowed to do. It, it's viewed as an invasion of privacy. So, if a letter were to go out that uh, uh, discuss some of those aspects, uh, we would expect the local branch would make the necessary adjustments so that it was appropriate for those countries. 
Perhaps I can show you an example, um, Mr. Jackson, if you can be shown from the tender bundle, uh, tab 94. Uh, I have it here in front of me. Have you had the opportunity, Mr. Jackson, to uh, view this correspondence previously? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, it's from, I believe, 1998, is it? Well before my time on the, uh, yes. on the governing body. I'm referring to the last week, Mr. Jackson. Have you had the opportunity to look at this correspondence? <laughs> I've been carrying, sorry. I've been caring for my father. Uh, I wish I could have had time to prepare properly, but I haven't been able to. And I assume the Commission was wanting to know what I could contribute personally from my experience. So, uh, no, I haven't had a chance to read all these. Yes, well, I'll take you through it, Mr. Jackson. Um, <clears throat> you will see this, you. this is a letter in April 1998 from the Australia branch to the Governing Body Service Committee. Now, I understand, of course, you're not on the Service Committee, but you'll see that Australia branch says we are applying now to your letter and it's referenced concerning the possibility of putting something in writing on the subject of confidentiality and the law in relation to child abuse matters. We appreciate the opinion of the writing and service committees and we thank you for the opportunity to comment further. We're sorry to be so long in replying and so on. And then in the next paragraph, up till now, the brothers generally expect that the elders will keep all matters confidential since this has been stressed a number of times. In Australia, it has happened that some elders have been prepared to accept punishment for contempt of court rather than disclose confidential information. However, we are now saying that elders should comply with the law where mandatory reporting is required if there is no exemption available to them. And then in the next paragraph, it has been suggested that the following be printed in a question box in our <coughs> kingdom ministry. It would be necessary to schedule it as part of the service meeting program unless we simply ask the presiding overseer or another elder simply to read the question and answer in the announcement part of the meeting. And then what is proposed is set out. Do you see that? Yes, I, I see that. And then you'll see there's an, a reply to that letter at tab 96. 96. On the 24th of July, 1998. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, from, I see that. You'll mm -hmm. see at the foot of the page, it's from the... Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania for the Service Committee, and it references the letter of 28 April 1998, referring to the suggestion for a possible question and box in the edition of our Kingdom Ministry, and then it says, after carefully considering the matter, it has been concluded that if the branch committee in Australia continues to recommend publishing the suggested material, then it would be appropriate for the branch to feature the suggested question and answer as outlined in your letter. It will not be necessary to schedule the information to be considered on a service meeting program. Uh, we'll leave it to the brothers to read the information presented. Now, what that suggests, and I'm providing you with the opportunity to comment on this or answer it, Mr. Jackson, what that suggests is that uh, even matters of that detail are uh, firstly, as a matter of practice, uh, put to <laughs> Bethel in New York for approval and um, secondly require such approval or consent? Uh, this particular instance obviously the, the uh, brothers in Australia wrote to the service committee but if I could just mention uh, the importance of this to us is that uh, the governing body gives direction with regard to the church services or the congregation meetings of Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, this, I assume, uh, and this is the first time I've seen the document, uh, is asking if they can include this in the actual program at the Kingdom Halls. And uh, I assume from what's said here, the governing body has, or the service committee of the governing body has given uh, direction on that. But if I can highlight, the reason for that is it involves our spiritual programs. Now, in, in making decisions on uh, 
the publications, I understand from what you say is that you're guided by the scriptures. That is correct. And that involves, um, obviously, interpreting the scriptures from time to time. Uh, that is the role of the governing body. And am I right in understanding that the governing body's interpretation of the scriptures on any particular point might change or develop from time to time? Uh, that is correct as well. So I think some examples might be, for example, uh, firstly the question of uh, blood fractions and whether that is or isn't covered by the prohibition for the receipt of blood transfusions. Um, that is correct as well, but if I could just mention, uh, when blood transfusions were first uh, introduced, uh, there wasn't a lot of options with regard to blood fractions. Yes, but the, my point is, or what I'm seeking to understand, is there was an interpretation at one point which said that members of the Jehovah's Witnesses should not receive blood fractions, but in more recent times it's been accepted, as I understand it, that there's no specific scriptural direction on that, so on blood fractions, that is, so that's a matter for the individual conscience of Jehovah's Witnesses. That's right, and Mr. Stewart, if I may mention, this is an example of the desire of the governing body not to go beyond the scriptures. Uh, clearly, we have the uh, direction in Acts chapter 15, 28 and 29, against blood. Uh, but if I could also mention, you see, uh, as with anything in the community, more and more knowledge becomes available medically. Uh, it can be very overwhelming uh, trying to see all the latest medical research and so on. But the governing body tries to make sure that they don't go beyond what is written. If we see that a direction from the scriptures uh, has perhaps been used too broadly, uh, then we're the first ones to try to correct that. And I take it too that the state of knowledge about the scriptures, and in particular historical knowledge about scriptures, uh, also improves or increases from time to time. Uh, that is correct, uh, but there are some basic things in the Bible that have not changed uh, right from the, the beginnings of the uh, Jehovah's Witness uh, religion, uh, and I won't take your time obviously going through those, but uh, it is important to realize what are basic things in the Bible. For example, is the Bible from God? Uh, that there is no possibility of us changing our viewpoint on that. Mr. Jackson, um, you probably know that we discussed with some of your members earlier in this hearing the relationship of the Bible being written at a time of particular political and social structure and its literal relevance in today's social and political context. Are you familiar with those discussions? I am. I did hear your, uh, your question, Your Honour, uh, and I, I, at the time, was quite frustrated that I didn't have an opportunity to answer. So I, I appear this opportunity well, I'm is going to give you. I'm, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Um, now, uh, it is plain that over time, in relation to matters of relevance to this Commission, our understanding, both um, medical, social and uh, of the political issues that arise, has changed. And you're aware of that? Uh, I am aware of that, Your Honour. Now, one of the characteristics that we have identified, and I've spoken about it, and I'm sure you know this, um, that is manifest in the area of sexual abuse of children within institutions is the child's incapacity to tell an adult about what's been happening to them. You're familiar with that problem? That is correct. I am familiar with that problem, yes. I've described it by reference to the admonition that was certainly 
prevalent when I was a child that children are to be seen but not heard. You understand? Mm -hmm. you familiar I do understand. With, you're, you're familiar with that concept? Yes, yes. Is it relevant to Jehovah's Witnesses? Uh, Your Honour, in our publications, obviously I can't give you examples now, but we'd be very happy to do that. Uh, one of the key things we try to help parents to do is to encourage their children to communicate with them. Uh, as a missionary in the South Pacific, the cultures in the South Pacific definitely follow what Your Honour just said. Uh, if children are being uh, disciplined or counselled, uh, they're not supposed to speak at all. And over and over again, we encourage parents, no, children need to express themselves. They need to feel the love so that they can do that. Um, you've got the Bible there. If you go to, I do. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, yes. verse 4, there's a discussion of a man presiding over his household having his children in subjection. Now, what does that mean? That's a very good question, Your Honour. Uh, biblically speaking, the word subjection infers respect uh, and a willingness co to comply with direction. Um, it does not... Uh, your, bi your Bible then provides a reference back to... Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. That is correct. Which imposes the obligation on fathers to bring their children up in the discipline and admonition of Jehovah. What's the discipline of Jehovah? So, Your Honour, the original language word that discipline it indicates a process of teaching, educating, making a disciple. Well, from that reference in Ephesians, your Bible takes us back to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, yes. And the exact quote is, whoever holds back his rod hates his son. What does that mean? Uh, so, Your Honour, you'll notice there's an asterisk there on the term rod, and you see the footnote? Yeah. Uh, discipline or punishment. Uh, so, in the application of this, uh, the, the term rod is used as uh, a symbol or a metaphor to indicate the authority to, uh, to give some punishment. For example, in a modern-day setting, uh, my father could say to me, uh, I don't go to the movies because I had uh, broken some of the rules of the home. So it's not about inflicting corporal punishment then? It absolutely is not about inflicting corporal punishment. It would have been when first written, wouldn't it? Uh, how people applied it back then at that time, of course, is, uh, uh, is open to question. Well, what you're telling me, as I understand it, is that your religion, your church, is prepared to interpret the Bible having regard to contemporary social attitudes and standards. Is that right? Uh, obviously, Your Honour, we need to take that into consideration. But the primary responsibility we have is to think, what does Jehovah God mean by this? And uh, we look at other scriptures... Uh, one of the problems that many folk have when they read the Bible is they take one verse and they assume it means something out of context or not in reference to other scriptures. So for our understanding, uh, Jehovah has said that children should be raised in a loving environment. Jesus was raised in such an environment. Well, I've taken you to the way your own church constructs the biblical references, which, as we've noticed, takes us back to Proverbs. Correct? That is correct. But what you've given us is the understanding which your church now has about how that's to apply in contemporary society. Is that right? Um, that's a good question. Obviously, I can only speak about what we understand this to mean now, but I would argue the case that even back in ancient times, 
uh, God did not have in mind for children to be beaten up in a bad way. Does your church accept corporal punishment of children? Uh, our church accepts uh, the family arrangement and expects that uh, uh, parents have the responsibility to discipline and raise their children. That doesn't answer my question. Do you accept I corporal see. punishment? Uh, in our literature, I think you'll see time and time again, we've, we've endeavoured to explain that here, discipline is referring to more a mental uh, point of view. Um, I, I, regret, I regret punishment. to tell you, you're still not answering my oh, question. Sorry. Do you accept okay. corporal punishment? No. You don't? Mm -hmm. not, not personally, no. And not as an organisation. We don't encourage it. But do you prohibit it? Uh, our literature has pointed out that the true way to discipline children is by educating them, not uh, giving corporal punishment. I now, can only, Your Honour, I can only tell you the spirit behind <coughs> our writings. Now, I'm sure you know that one of the problems revealed by the... one of the problems for survivors revealed by their evidence in this very hearing is their concern about having to approach men within the church to tell their story and then have that story assessed and judged by men alone. Do you understand? I do understand that, Your Honour. Now, in the society in which you live and which I live, uh, we have seen um, significant change, although perhaps not yet complete, in the role which women play in the decision-making um, and govern, government of our society, haven't we? Uh, we certainly have. Yeah. And that's a reflection of a contemporary understanding of the role and contribution which everyone in our society, society can make to the common good, isn't it? Uh, yes. Um, now... Um, and I'm sure you know of the concerns expressed by the um, women who have given evidence in this hearing about the confrontational uh, confrontation um, uh, and difficult, difficulty in that confrontation which they found in approaching a male-dominant uh, um, uh, structure. Do you understand that? I do understand that, Your Honour. Is there room for the church to change that? Uh, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked them. Uh, is there a chance to make elders uh, women or make women elders? Uh, no. Uh, there is no leeway there. But, Your Honour, if why, I could why just is, mention... Why is that? Can you tell me why that is? Sure, yes. <coughs> I mean, uh, if we turn to first... Is, is it because of a literal application of the Bible? Uh, Your Honour, it, it goes back to the theme of the scriptures right from the creation of Adam, right through Israelite times to the Christian era. But in all fairness, may I just uh, yeah. say something with regard to that? I oh, certainly. You see, yeah, uh, the, the role of women in uh, the Jehovah's Witness religion is a very dignified role. Uh, we, we don't uh, make women, well, we certainly do not want women to feel like second-rate citizens. Uh, in God's view, men and women are equal. But even people who fly aeroplanes realize you can't fly an aeroplane by committee. There has to be a pilot and a co-pilot. And that's the Bible arrangement, uh, not because of any lack of intelligence or lack of ability on the part of women. It is an arrangement that has stood the test of time. Now, within that arrangement, uh, the Bible clearly states that a man does not have absolute authority over a woman, and a woman is, is a co-worker, a complement, the Bible refers uh, to as that. So I think in the context of understanding how women are treated uh, among Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, I think if you investigate it further, you would see there are very many happy women in the marital arrangement. It used to be the case that all of our women were, uh, all of our pilots were women, wasn't it? 
We changed that. All of our pilots were. Oh, did we? We were men. All men? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Oh, but we were men, yes. Yeah, we were men, and we've changed that now, and we have women who are pilots. Why couldn't the church accept that women can contribute to the decision making processes, particularly in relation to allegations of sexual abuse brought forward by women? Uh, the answer, Your Honour, is that we expect women to be involved in that. Uh, but in the actual role as elders within the Christian congregation, uh, there is a very firm standard set there. There is no leeway whatsoever for that in the belief of Jehovah's Witnesses. But if I could mention, some of the reports that you've considered are from 25 years ago. And if I understand correctly from what little I heard of the Commission in the last few days, Mr. Spinks uh, very uh, accurately described that there has been more an awareness of Jehovah's Witnesses to make sure that uh, any victim who has, has been a victim of a horrible crime does not re be required to actually go before three men. Uh, we've made changes, Your Honour, because those changes in the actual technicalities of the policies don't change. They're, they're not affected by the actual Bible principles, except the very important principle of showing love, empathy and concern and trying to avoid any form of trauma. And that's, that's our desire. If it wasn't perfect before, which it wasn't, we've tried to change that. And we will make further changes when we uh, consider the uh, recommendations of the Commission. Well, we'll come back to your processes later on. I'll leave you now with Mr Stewart. Thank you, Your Honour. Just on the, on the last point, um, <clears throat> Mr. Jackson, with regard to a survivor of, a, of sexual abuse um, having to make the allegation directly to uh, the accuser, uh, do you agree that in those circumstances, should a survivor have to make the allegation in the presence uh, of the accused? Uh, I agree that it would be better for them not to do that unless uh, the, the victim wants to do that. Yes, well, I, that's why I phrased my question in the way that I did. And so I'll repeat it, that uh, do you agree that in those circumstances the survivor should have to make the allegation in the presence of the accused? Uh, sorry, I, I don't understand your question. Could you rephrase it? Do you agree that there are no circumstances in which the survivor of a sexual assault should have to make her allegation in the presence of the person whom she accuses of having assaulted her? I agree that uh, that is the case. And as I understand you, you, you're saying on your understanding that that's not required by your rules. In other words, your rules do not require the survivor of a sexual assault to have to make her allegation in the presence of the person whom she accuses as having assaulted her? Uh, if, I if I understand your question correctly, uh, from what I've heard from uh, Mr. Speaks' testimony, that is not something that we require now. I'm prefacing this in the fact that it's not my field that I work with every day. Mr. Speaks and those who work in the service department work with these matters, but that is my understanding. Yes. And so do you uh, accept then that that should be made clear in your documents, manuals and instructions, in other words, that it should be made clear that a survivor of a sexual assault should not have to make her allegation in the presence of the person whom she accuses as having assaulted her? Absolutely. Mr. Jackson, can a branch committee publish its own manuals and guidelines in respect of judicial committee procedures for responding to allegations of child sexual abuse? 
Uh, I would think it would be unusual for that to happen, seeing it's not my field per se. Uh, I couldn't give a, a, an ex inclusive answer with regard to that, but uh, as far as a general principle goes, I would expect that they would get back to the service committee on it. Well, what we see in the documents uh, that we have that govern this issue currently is that they are documents which originate under the auspices of or with the approval of the governing body. So I'm referring to... Uh, that yeah. Sorry, Mr. Jackson. Sorry, uh, my apologies. So I'm referring to uh, organise to do Jehovah's Will, uh, shepherd the flock of God, and the guidelines that are published to the branch committees. Um, thank you. Uh, it's a rather long question, but if I've understood it correctly, uh, we would expect the general framework of uh, what we do to be published uh, as approved by the governing body. But you see, when we say published, uh, letters are published by the local branches that indicate any variance that may need to take place with regard to those policies. So that's why I was just hesitant to say that it's all inclusive. Well, if the Australia branch, for example, was to decide that the investigative step which precedes the appointment of a judicial committee uh, need not be done by two elders, but can in Australia be done by uh, a woman acting on their behalf, would that be something that would be open to the Australia committee to follow or to adopt? Uh, Mr Stewart, I certainly would hope that the Australia branch committee would get back to the service committee uh, with the reasons why that's needed and then eventually I would hope that would get to the governing body so that we could approve uh, whatever changes are needed worldwide. But it may be that the branch committee in Australia has a different view on these matters than the branch committee in some other country. Uh, we'll take one close to home, New Zealand, for example. Uh, well, that yeah. may, let me do one further afield anywhere, if you like. The Philippines may take a different view. Is there space? for the branch committees to have different investigative procedures in different parts of the world? Uh, to answer your question, the answer is yes, uh, that is possible. But if the reason for doing so is to avoid trauma, uh, then that's something the governing body is interested in. We want to, to see how we can encourage all the countries to, uh, to avoid that. But if it's a matter of technicality that they need to do it a certain way, uh, then, yes, we would expect they would at least notify us, and there could be differences. Mr Jackson, is there any biblical impediment to a woman being appointed to investigate an allegation? Uh, there is no biblical impediment to a woman being involved with the investigation. Is In fact, uh, I think... Oh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, Your Honour. No, you continue. Uh, and I think that's one of the benefits of the Royal Commission, as what has been brought to light, is that it certainly it is good for a woman to be involved, with particularly some of these sensitive areas. But if I could just mention, uh, many of our publications are very broad in aspect. We're not just talking about this one aspect of, uh, of child abuse, which is a horrific crime, but it can also... The same principles are used for other sins, such as drunkenness and other things the Bible mentions. Uh, but in this sensitive area, yes, I think the Commission has clearly shown that it would be good for women to be involved. Is there any biblical impediment to a determination, a judicial determination, uh, being made by a body which includes women, although uh, uh, the, the elders thereafter... Uh, may respond in terms of the, uh, 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 as the decision maker in relation to what happens to someone after a decision has been made as to the truth or not of an allegation? That's a good question. Uh, could I just mention first, Your Honour, something? Uh, please uh, bear with me on this. 
the judicial system that Jehovah's Witnesses use is not in competition with the criminal justice system. We respect that, and we feel that uh, that's something that uh, the community needs to uh, make use of. But also, if I can just highlight, any victim is not viewed as someone that needs to stand before a judicial committee. They did not do anything wrong. They're the ones that have been victimized. They need the help. Now, to answer your question directly, uh, women can be involved in this very sensitive area, but biblically speaking, the role of judges in the congregation, it lays with men. That's what the Bible says, and that's what we endeavor to follow. Can you give me the reference for that? Uh, yes. Uh, in that, the is, that, is, that is judges being only men. Not elders, uh, but judges well, being only men. Okay, I would have to check it. I think Deuteronomy is one of them. But uh, with regard to First Timothy chapter 3, First Timothy chapter 3, and uh, I'm sure you, you're only very familiar with this, uh, in verse 1, the statement is trustworthy. If a man is reaching out to be an overseer, he is desirous of a fine work. The overseer should therefore be irreprehensible, a husband of one wife, moderate in habits, sound in mind, orderly, hospitable, qualified to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, not, uh, but reasonable, not quarrelsome, uh, not a lover of money, a man presiding over his own household in a fine manner, having his children subjection with all seriousness. Uh, in biblical times, uh, the, the same expression that is used for elder is also used for older man. And uh, when we're translating, of course, that is my field, sometimes it is hard to, to decide whether it means elder, as in a position, or older man. But definitely, when it speaks of judges at the gates in Israel, uh, we're talking about older men. But I apologize, Your Honor, seeing uh, uh, you asked this question, I cannot give you the exact scriptural reference, but we'll be happy well, to do I, that. We would appreciate it, because one possible... Uh, modification to meet um, this issue of the lack of women as judges of allegations brought forward by women against men um, may be a modification of your process to include women in the judicial determination step. You understand? I do understand, Your Honour, and we will make sure you get those references. And can you understand how a woman a young woman, any woman might feel when allegations which she makes of having been sexually assaulted by a male are determined exclusively by men? Uh, in the context of a police station, I can understand that, Your Honour, but please, may I also mention the role of these elders, they are friends of those in the congregation. Their role is to shepherd, help, care for. And uh, so although perhaps a young person may feel that way, and we would do everything we can within the Bible parameters to make sure that that is eased so that a person isn't put in that uh, very difficult situation. But still, ultimately, the decision, maybe without that person, would be made. And the decision is not concerning the, the criminality that is the criminal system. The, the decision is concerning the spiritual cleanliness of our congregation and the rehabilitation of those that commit sins. That's to concentrate on the abuser. But what I'm talking about is the position of the person who's been abused. Do you understand? I do understand that. So you're, 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 and all, women... all that you've just said is talking about it from only one perspective, you see? Mm -hmm. So from the other perspective, mm -hmm. with a victim, uh, the main thing for us is helping, supporting, and God, and women will be involved with that. You see, the Judicial Committee is not judging the victim. Uh, the elders in the congregation and the women in the congregation have the obligation to give full support to any victim. Well, that may be so, but the point I was seeking to have you address was can you understand how a woman might feel when allegations which she brings forward against a man in the congregation are judged 
uh, are considered and judged entirely by men. Uh, it's, I, obviously, I'm not a woman, so I wouldn't no. like to speak on their behalf, but the two of us, uh, I'm sure, uh, could understand from what has been expressed that, and believe that, that perhaps there would be a hesitancy there. And uh, can I add this to the question, because it's one of the factual circumstances we face in this hearing. What, can you understand the, the circumstance for a woman who brings an allegation against an elder, who is a friend of the others, who must judge the truth or otherwise of the allegation? Can you understand how that person must feel? I, I can try to understand it, Your Honour, yes. Uh, but again, could I ask, and again, this is not my field of activity, uh, but as, as far as I understand, uh, we have a, a, a process in place whereby a neutral member, uh, like a circuit overseer, will be involved with uh, such a sensitive case. It would be the case, would it not, that even a circuit overseer is going to know an elder well? Uh, they, they should be familiar, but they also know the victim well. Uh, you see, it's, it's not taking into consideration the spiritual responsibility. Uh, you see, these elders are not paid to do their job. They do it because of love and concern and wanting to shepherd the flock. And so I think what we're missing is the spiritual element to this whole thing, where people are com comfortable talking to one another. Well, you, and, I don't know whether you heard the evidence of the survivors here. Did you hear that evidence? No, unfortunately, that was a bad time for me caring for my father. I'm, I apologise. But I will look forward to hearing a, a summary of it. Yes, Mr Stewart. Yes, because, <clears throat> Mr Jackson, uh, for example, the elders who hear these allegations, one of the things they have to do is to measure the credibility of the, of the person who says that she suffered abuse. Is that not right? Uh, yes. Uh, as, as a prosecutor would also uh, measure the evidence that he does before he goes uh, to a case. Well, not so much the prosecutor. Perhaps you're thinking of the judge. Uh, sorry, no. If I understand correct, well, I'm, I'm going way out of my field because I'm not a lawyer, but I thought any case that would go to the police and then brought to the prosecution, you'd have to at least establish there was some validity. Yes, uh, maybe right. that's not the case in Australia. Well, the, the point um, is, is this, Mr Jackson, isn't it, that you've appreciated, I think, uh, that an elderly man may be in a difficult position to understand just how a young woman, for example, making an accusation or an allegation of child sexual abuse feels in having to make that allegation? Uh, that is true, but at the same time, perhaps someone who's never experienced the trauma that these, that these victims have felt, uh, even a woman may find that very hard as well, because it's such a personal uh, uh, experience. But you'll accept, I'm sure, that in many instances, where a woman or young woman makes such an allegation, she would feel a lot more comfortable having to make the allegation and explain the circumstances to another woman. Uh, I can't say that I would give a comment on that, uh, Mr. Stewart, because, uh, you see, again, it takes away the consideration of the relationships in our congregations. It's not like your churches where people just go to church and don't uh, talk to one another. Uh, their congregations do become familiar and there, there can be a friendship. So I, I agree that the point you're trying to get at, we need to know what the victim is comfortable in doing with regard to who they speak to. Well, you gave us um, a, a scripture, uh, 1 Timothy uh, 3 verse 1, which as I understood it was the authority for the principle that, as it's put there, an overseer, but in, I think, modern language, an elder, must be a man. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. And is there a scriptural 
reference, and perhaps this is the one you said you'd need to come back to us on, is there a scriptural reference which says that the investigation of allegations of uh, serious misconduct must be done by an elder? Um, if I could just clarify your question a little, uh, Mr. Stewart. Uh, you see, what I think you've heard in the, the Commission is that we have said that women can be involved in all these various aspects uh, leading up to the actual decision-making, whether or not someone is spiritually qualified to remain in the congregation. So just that one aspect, the actual Judicial Committee itself, is where we've we uh, believe that men would be involved. Mr Jackson, that's the question I was putting to you, you see. I was wondering whether you could have a structure which meant that the judicial decision as to whether or not um, the allegation was true could be determined by a body capable of having women represented on it. And that body's decision would then be taken to the elders in relation to decisions to disfellowship. Do you understand? I understand, uh, Your Honour. Well, is it possible, and, uh, is it, is uh, it possible uh, to make that change? It is possible to make sure that elders are fully aware of the whole story. But for women to be elders in the congregation, that is not possible. No, Mr Jackson, I wasn't asking you that. I was asking you, okay, to, consider, I was asking you to consider whether the process may involve a determination which we outside the church would call a judicial determination, that is, is the allegation true or false? And then that decision having been made, the elders would then make a decision as to the consequence, being disfellowship or otherwise. Do you understand? I do understand. Could women be involved in the determination of whether or not the allegation is true? Uh, well, Your Honour, if I could say, I think they already are involved. Not in the, in the, decision, the, not in the decision, Mr Jackson. Please address my question. Okay. Uh, but, uh, yes, in, in, well, please, could I just use an example? If an underage child uh, it says that something has happened and then two women are involved with helping that person, surely they have to decide whether or not the facts are true they, and present those to the elders. Yes, Otherwise, Mr. how would the elders Mr. know Mr. what the Jackson, facts are? Mr. Jackson, you're not dealing with my question. I'm sorry, would you like I apologise. Would you like me to put it again? Would you like me to put it again? If you would, please. Your process at the moment <coughs> has a judicial determination which is made by the elders. And that's the point at which a decision is made as to whether the allegation is true or false. Do you understand that? Mm hmm You do? I do understand that, Your Honour. Is it possible for the process to be modified so that that decision can be made by a body which could include women, that is, the decision as to whether or not the allegation is true or false, made by a body which could include women, and that decision would thereafter be uh, uh, acted upon uh, and a decision made as to whether or not to disfellowship by the elders. Do you understand? I do understand, and I apologise, Your Honour, for not uh, answering directly. I didn't understand fully what you were saying. Uh, the, the answer, Your Honour, is uh, such a, a, a situation would be worthy of us considering and doing research and checking the scriptures. Uh, yes, the, the possibility of considering that is there. Thank you. Um, Thank you, and I apologise again. Um, Mr Jackson... I'd like to refer you to Shepherd the Flock of God, which is tab 120 at page 71, ringtail 72. <clears throat> now, this is the manual uh, for elders, uh, and it's been applicable since, as I understand it, 2010. Is that right? Uh, this is, yes, and, that appears to be the case. And would it be the case that 
um, this manual came through the processes of the writing committee? Uh, this manual would have been prepared uh, with the help of the service departments uh, and uh, the service committee would have uh, uh, prepared this information. Uh, and yes, uh, the writing committee would have needed to read everything and check to see it's scripturally uh, applicable. Yes. And what I'm, I'm showing you, page 71, but that's in chapter 5, which is headed determining whether a judicial committee should be formed. And it starts out by setting out various... Uh, wrongdoings, uh, serious ones, including manslaughter, attempted suicide, premier, and so on. So that's the context. But you'll see at paragraph 37, it says, even though a Christian has been accused of wrongdoing serious enough to require judicial action, a judicial committee should not be formed unless the wrongdoing has been established. And the word established is in italics. So my question is, who is it who decides whether the wrongdoing has been established? So it, it is my understanding that two others uh, normally would investigate the matter to see if there is some substance to the accusation. Uh, having in mind, as you mentioned, uh, this could be ranging from someone getting drunk to someone committing immorality and so on. Uh, so those two elders would at least see if there was some basis of the accusation, and they would get back to the body of elders who then would appoint the judicial committee. Yes. So then the question is, is it scripturally necessary that that role is performed by two elders as opposed to, for example, a woman appointed for them? Uh, may I ask, Mr. Stewart, is this the same question that is Honor asked, or is there a, a difference? Uh, are you just emphasizing the point? Well, I'm trying to understand your answer, Mr. Jackson. So if you can just address yourself to my question, what I've sought to do is to identify a very specific decision in the process. It's the decision as to uh, is the wrongdoing established, and you've said that that's done by two, two elders who then report back to the body of elders, which then appoints uh, a judicial committee. So I'm asking scripturally, is there room for that decision as to whether the wrongdoing uh, has been established to be anyone other than elders? Uh, good, I understand your question, uh, Mr. Stewart. Uh, could we take the case of where the two elders cannot speak to the victim, that perhaps the, the, they don't want to traumatize the victim, uh, and maybe two women uh, that are very close to the victim are able to speak to them. Uh, in a setting such as that, all the elders would have is the testimony of the two women with regard to the testimony of the, of the victim. Uh, so in that way, the women are saying whether they feel that it's a, a valid case or not. So the answer to your question is, yes, women can be involved scripturally. But you know, Mr. Jackson, my question had nothing to do with involvement. It had to do with who makes the decision. The person who makes the tea is involved, in a sense, if they bring the tea in when the decision is being considered. I'm not talking about involvement, I'm talking about who makes the decision. Am I to understand your evidence is that it must be elders who make the decision? Uh, that is my understanding. Yes. And are you able to furnish a scriptural reference for that? In other words, where it is that it's provided in the scriptures that that is necessary, necessarily so? Uh, the principle that we were discussing before is... The headship principle found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm sure, Mr. Stewart, you've already referred to this in the commission, but uh, please bear with me as we look at it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Uh, you have it there already? Well, this time I'll be grateful for the page number, Mr. Jackson. Okay, so... 1536. Ah, uh, thank you. 
So, verse 3 of chapter 11. But I want you to know that the head of every man is the Christ. In turn, the head of a woman is the man. In turn, the head of the Christ is God. So, in the church decision-making arrangement, uh, is based on the headship principle that we have in the family and in the Jehovah's Witness community as a whole. That uh, scripturally, the men make the final decisions, but that does not mean that there is no input from the women. Yes, thank you, Mr. Jackson. Um, While you're in 1 Corinthians, perhaps you would take a look at 1 Corinthians 14, verses 33 to 35. I have it already, yes. Uh, which says that, For God is a God not of disorder but of peace, as in all the congregations of the holy ones. Let the women keep silent in the congregations, for it is not permitted for them to speak. Rather, let them be in subjection, as the law also says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the congregation. Now, as I understand it, that's, that's not applied in the Jehovah's Witness organization. In other words, you do allow women to speak in the congregation. Uh, I'm sorry, you have two questions there. Can I answer the first one first? Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses do follow what is stated here. I can explain uh, the second one is, uh, yes, women are allowed to speak in the congregation. May I explain to you the reason why I feel we do follow what is here? Yes, of course. Okay, so you notice in verse, uh, th uh, verse 34, that's where it says, keep silent. But if you look up at verse 28, there it says, but if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent. So the expression, keep silent, is referred to a male. And then verse uh, 30, where it's talking about prophets, and then if one was in verse 30, it says, if another one receives a revelation while sitting there, let the first speaker keep silent. So this chapter is talking about orderly conduct in the church meetings or in the congregation meetings. Uh, so in verse 28, uh, if someone starts speaking in another language, but there's no interpreter, the scripture says, let him keep silent. Now, it appears that in the congregation there was a problem because some women were actually challenging, arguing, debating with the men who were taking the lead in giving teaching. Now, you may not feel that that is the case, but that's the context of what is said here. And in chapter 11, it refers to the fact that a woman could speak with a head covering. So I think a, a very literal interpretation of verse 34 and 35 is not appropriate in the context. Are you able to give an overarching explanation as to when it is that what is said in the Bible should be taken literally, and, and when it should be given uh, an expansive interpretation as in this instance. Very good. Uh, the answer is, Jehovah's Witnesses, you see, it's not a matter of seven men on the governing body taking one verse and saying, what do you think it means? What do you think it means? Jehovah's Witnesses try to use the Bible to explain itself. So here in first. Corinthians chapter 4, if we were to take the viewpoint that this literally means that a woman cannot speak, uh, then we would be not going in accordance with the context. So the answer to your question is, you have to have the whole picture, and that's something that for yourself, and this is obviously said in all due respect, uh, someone who reads the Bible their whole life should understand the whole picture. And if I, perhaps by means of helping you with regard to that, uh, there are two other scriptures. One is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, which I believe is on a, uh, referred to uh, in the commission. 
First Peter, uh, sorry, First Timothy chapter 2, that's page 1588. And uh, there it says, uh, verse 11 and 12, Let a woman learn in silence with full submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, but she is to remain silent. Now, you notice the asterisk gives the alternative to that, to remain calm, remain quiet. So, obviously, this is talking about the role of women not jumping up excitedly, arguing with others. And it's similar to what First Peter, and please bear with me, First Peter uh, chapter 3 says with regard to a woman who is married to a non-Christian. And uh, in First Peter chapter 3, that's page 1623, Mr. Stewart, have you got it? Uh, no, I haven't, but I'm sure you'll read it to me, Mr. Jackson. Okay, and uh, verse 1 of First Peter chapter 3 in the same way you wives be in subjection to your husbands, so that if any are not obedient to the word, they may be won without a word through the conduct of their wives. Now, to take the position that the expression without a word means they would never, ever, ever speak to their husband would be a misapplication of Scripture. So the governing body when we consider these things, is very much aware of trying to get the whole context of things. Otherwise, it's like asking two people for an opinion on something and getting three different opinions. Uh, if someone just takes one verse, they can have all sorts of opinions about it. But the work of Jehovah's Witnesses is to try and understand the whole Bible as one message from God. Now, I don't expect that you would have the same viewpoint, but I thank you for at least letting me express our viewpoint. Mr. Jackson, let's make it a little more concrete then uh, in a very uh, specific example. Now, you'll know that one of the things that's emerged in the last couple of weeks, that in Australia at least, uh, amongst the Jehovah's, or in the Jehovah's Witness organization, there's a practice of not reporting child sexual abuse allegations to the authorities unless required by law to do so. Do you accept that? Uh, I'm not familiar with the statistics or the general practice, but I can tell you uh, why there is a spiritual dilemma uh, because of this uh, question. Well, that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm driving at. Uh, so perhaps you can address that question specifically, which is this, is there a scriptural basis to that policy being, or practice, being not to report child sexual abuse allegations to the authorities unless required by law to do so? Uh, thank you for the opportunity to explain this. Uh, I think very clearly uh, Mr. Toole pointed out that if the Australian government and all the states was to make mandatory reporting, it would make it so much easier for us. But the ethical or the, uh, what, let's say, the spiritual dilemma that an elder has is to consider how did he get the information that he has been told. Uh, now, there's a, a scriptural principle in the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, and I'm not saying, Mr. Stewart, that any one of these principles takes precedent, but it is something that the elder would need to take into consideration. So Proverbs 25, verses 8 through 10. Uh, that's on page 905. That's uh, Proverbs 25, 8 through 10. Do not rush into a legal dispute for what you will do later Sorry, for what will you do later if your neighbor humiliates you? Plead your case with your neighbor, but do not reveal what you were told confidentially, so that the one listening will not put you to shame and you spread a bad report that cannot be recalled. Now, I'm not saying, Mr. Stewart, this is the only factor, but it is one factor uh, that all ministers of religion have grappled, <laughs> grappled with uh, when it comes to an issue such as this. The second issue is that uh, elders are told, as is 
uh, mention in First Peter, First Peter, and uh, the fifth chapter. This is on page sixteen twenty five. 1625, 1 Peter chapter 5, and verses 2 and 3. Uh, have you got it, Mr. Stewart? I did. Yes. Uh, shepherd the flock of God under your care, serving as overseers, not under compulsion, but willingly before God, not for love of dishonest gain, but eagerly. And then this is the point not lording it over those who are God's inheritance, but becoming examples to the flock. Uh, the point being here, another aspect that an elder needs to consider is he does not have the authority to lord it over or take over control of a family arrangement where a person who, let's say it's a, a victim who is 24, 25 years of age, has a right to decide whether or not they will report that incident. Uh, they also respect the family arrangement that the appointed guardian, who is not the perpetrator, uh, has a certain right to. So th this is the spiritual dilemma that we have because at the same time, uh, we want to make sure that children are cared for. So if the government does happen to make mandatory uh, uh, reporting, that will make this dilemma so much easier for us because we all want the same goal, that children will be cared for properly. Let's take the situation in a family where <clears throat> one of the children, let's say the eldest, uh, reports having been abused uh, by her father. Uh, yes, uh, so is there a question? If, yes, if that report is um, accepted as having uh, validity, you would accept that the potential is, is that the other children in the family remain at risk? Uh, that is correct. And by not reporting to the authorities, is the case not that the confidentiality of the one who reported is regarded as being more important than to protect those who are still at risk? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Stewart, if I could just... What I'm trying to highlight is there are several factors that make it hard for a minister of religion uh, to make a clear-cut or quick decision on this matter. Uh, obviously, I think, again, what has been highlighted to the Commission, uh, the elders should encourage the the guardian of the child or whoever is in that family arrangement that is not the perpetrator to notify the authorities. Leaving aside the question of uh, overriding mandatory law from the civil authorities, do you see the possibility within the scriptures as you've identified them for a change in the practice uh, of Jehovah's Witnesses? In other words, would it be within the scriptures for the Jehovah's Witness organization to adopt a policy which says that in cases where there are others at risk, a report must be made to the authorities? Uh, that is a possible thing for us to consider. And I think already the assumption is there that if any elder was, was to see that there was some definite risk, that their conscience should move them to do that. But the point I was trying to make, Mr. Stewart, is uh, there are other scriptural factors that, that may be, make that a little complicated, and it would certainly be a lot easier if we had mandatory uh, laws on that. Now, turning to another aspect that we've dealt with, which is the question of the two-witness rule, you will be aware that if there's no confession, then two witnesses to serious wrongdoing... Uh, are required or to two similar events of serious wrongdoing in order that there is sufficient evidence to establish a judicial committee. Do you understand that? I do understand that. Is there a scriptural basis to that? Uh, the two witness uh, testimony, is that what you're asking, Mr. Stewart? Yeah, that's right. Uh, absolutely. If, if I could take you to the book of Matthew, 
uh, chapter 18, Matthew 18, and that's on page 1330. Matthew 18, yes, and here 16. the words of our Lord, uh, verse 16, that's correct, uh, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in, in, this is talking in the sense of a judicial setting, uh, and if he does not listen, take along with you one or two more, so that on the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be established. So from this, and I can give you a list of several other scriptures, but I don't want to test your patience and take into all these verses. Uh, but basically this is a theme right through the Christian Greek scriptures, the New Testament, that the rules for evidence for a judicial hearing involve two witnesses. But please allow me to say further, uh, this is only talking about setting up a judicial uh, a, a, a committee. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that Jehovah's Witnesses would feel that someone is totally 100% uh, squeaky clean just because there was only one uh, witness uh, to the crime. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by 100% squeaky clean. I mean, the reality is if there's only one witness in the case of child sexual abuse, then uh, it cannot be taken further by the elders and as it's put in the literature, it's left in the hands of Jehovah. Uh, yes, but um, please may I correct your uh, comment on that uh, with all due respect. Uh, you see, by squeaky clean, I'm meaning that it's not like someone being exonerated by a judicial hearing whereby there's double jeopardy and they can't be uh, uh, taken before the judicial hearing again. Uh, it, 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 our literature has said, and we agree, that in most cases with children with child abuse, uh, they are telling the truth. That that's an established thing. It's, they're not making up these stories. So immediately the elders would put into place uh, protection measures to help, to make sure that the family cares for the child and uh, that uh, uh, due steps are taken to protect the child. So I take it you say that that is what elders around the world should definitely do. Uh, they should do, because uh, Christian principles indicate if they, uh, if they realize a child is in a dangerous situation, action should be taken. The judicial hearing is simply us determining whether a person, the perpetrator, has committed a sin that would warrant them being put out of the congregation. But that doesn't mean to say we're stupid and that we think that someone uh, hasn't done something. I want to take you back then to the scriptural basis for that. So you've referred to Matthew 18, verse 16. And as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that in turn really is a reference back to Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. In other words, what uh, Jesus Christ was doing is referring back to that aspect of Mosaic law, dealing with... Uh, evidence. Uh, he did quote as he often did from the Mosaic Law, but he gave a Christian application. So, but that is an element to be found in the Mosaic Law as set out in Deuteronomy 19.15, is that right? It is an element that is found in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, <clears throat> what I'm interested in is, and perhaps you can help me on this, is that why that applies to a case of sexual assault, when clearly uh, what was being addressed uh, in the reference in Matthew that, that you gave us uh, was not a question of sexual assault. Uh, yes, if I can uh, just clarify that a little further then. Uh, there are basic principles that the Bible highlights, and uh, I can give you 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Uh, Sorry, Mr. Stewart. Yes, carry you on. You can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. First uh, Timothy chapter 5, verse 19. It's not just a one-off verse, but this is a basic principle for rules of evidence as found in the Bible. But if I could just emphasize again, this is only referring to a church-appointed committee that determines whether a person should remain in the congregation or not. 
the judicial system, and I'm sure if I can save the court's or the commission's time, I'm sure you're going to want to refer me back to Deuteronomy where it mentions the penalty of stoning. But what we need to remember is the laws that were given back in the nation of Israel. You had the judiciary, you had the punishment system, everything combined together. When the Christian arrangement came about with our Lord Jesus Christ giving us direction, the Christian church does not have the authority to throw people into prison, to execute, or to do anything to them. So the judicial system in the Christian arrangement involves the spiritual cleanliness of the congregation, and the rules of evidence remain the same all the way through. Well, Mr. Jackson, that's exactly the point I want to get to. You'll be familiar, and perhaps we can go to Deuteronomy 22, 23 to 27. Deuteronomy 22, 23 to 27. Page 304. So where it said that if a man is found lying down with a woman who is the wife of another man, both of them must die together. Now, let me just preface this. I'm not addressing the question of the stoning. I'm addressing the question of evidence. Um, The man who lay down with the woman as well as the woman. uh, Sorry, I, I read that. Badly, both of them must die together, the man who lay down with the woman as, as well as the woman. So you must remove what is bad out of Israel. Then it says, if a virgin is engaged to a man and another man happens to meet her in the city and lies down with her, you should bring them both out to the gate of that city and stone them to death. The girl, because she did not scream in the city, and the man, because he humiliated the wife of his fellow man. So you must remove what is evil from your midst. And then the next example is the one I'm particularly interested in. If, however, the man happened to meet the engaged girl in the field, and the man overpowered her and lay down with her, and the man who lay down with her, sorry, the man who lay down with her is to die by himself, and you must do nothing to the girl. The girl has not committed a sin deserving of death. This case is the same as when a man attacks his fellow man and murders him. For he happened to meet her in the field, and the engaged girl screamed, but there was no one to rescue her. So the point of this... Uh, last example is that uh, there's no second witness, is there? Because the woman's in the field, she screamed, but there was no one to rescue her. Do you accept that? Uh, Could I explain, uh, Mr. Stewart, that, you see, I think already under testimony, uh, some of Jehovah's Witnesses have explained that the two uh, witnesses are needed can be, in some cases, the circumstances. Uh, I think, was it a, uh, an that. example given? I'll come to that, Mr. Jackson. Okay, so. We'll get through this a lot quicker and easier if we just address it one step at a time. So, okay. the, the present step... So, the answer to your question? The present step is Sorry? this, is that in that example, you accept it's a case where uh, the uh, there was no other witness beyond the woman herself. Uh, there was no other witness except the woman herself, but added to that were the circumstances. Yes, well, the circumstances were that she was raped in the field. Mm-hmm. And, yes, but they were circumstances. And it was sufficient, there being only one witness, it was nevertheless sufficient for the conclusion that the man should be stoned to death. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. Now... Is it, I think we're agreeing on the point. Yes, is it not the case that had Jesus been asked about a case of sexual abuse, he may have referred back to this part of Deuteronomy and said that it's not required to have two witnesses? Um, I certainly would like to ask Jesus that, and I, I can't at the moment. I hope to in the future. Uh, but... Uh, uh, that's a hypothetical question which we, if we had an answer then we could support what you said. Well it's hypothetical in a sense but really what I'm, I'm driving at is, is the scriptural basis and, and you the scholar, I'm not uh, is the scriptural basis to the two witness rule uh, really so solid or is there not space for your governing body to recognise that in cases of sexual abuse uh, it need not apply? 
Uh, again, if I could just mention the fact that, uh, that we've already acknowledged that circumstances can also be one of the witnesses. Well, I'll, I'll come to that, but my, my, my question is a different one. It's whether the scriptural basis to, a to the two-witness rule in relation to cases of sexual abuse has a proper foundation. Uh, we believe it does because of the number of times that that principle is emphasized in the scriptures. Now, you'll be aware, of course, in the case of adultery, so long as there are two witnesses to the circumstances of opportunity, that will be sufficient. Yes. So, in other words, there needn't be two witnesses to uh, the act of adultery itself, but only to the circumstances of opportunity. Uh, sorry, I, I, you would need to walk me through that a little All further. Right, well, I'm not I, quite I, sure. I was trying to do it by a shortcut, but I'll take you to the document. Uh, it's at, in the same Shepherd uh, the Flock book, which is tab 120 at page So you'll see in, in uh, you have paragraph 11 there? Uh, paragraph, yes, I do. So this is also in the chapter dealing with determining whether a judicial committee should be formed. Um, on the subject of evidence testified to by at least two witnesses that the accused stayed all night in the same house with a person of the opposite sex or in the same house with a known homosexual under improper circumstances. That's the heading. And then it goes mm -hmm. on to say elders should use good judgment in assessing the situation before forming a judicial committee. And in the second dot point, it says, if there are no extenuating circumstances, the judicial committee would be formed on the basis of strong circumstantial evidence of uh, pornea. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see... Um, at, at the foot of the page, there's an example um, of a married brother spending an inordinate amount of time with his female secretary. And, and two lines from the bottom, it says, Later, when he claims to be leaving overnight for a business trip, his suspicious wife and a relative follow him to the secretary's home, and they observe, essentially, the opportunity of adultery to have taken place. And then those two witnesses will be sufficient to uh, establish the case. Do you see that? I do see that. So now, in the case of um, child sexual abuse, um, it should be, should it not, that a witness to an opportunity for the sexual abuse to have taken place would be the sufficient second witness? Uh, yes. If, it's, uh, if there is no... Uh uh, what does it say here? Uh, under improper, uh, improper circumstances. Yeah. So a second witness to circumstantial or corroborating evidence would be sufficient to fulfill the second witness requirement. Uh, that's a very large question, and I think it's something that we would need to uh, consider carefully. Yes, well, it's just important as to whether the second witness has to be a witness to the abuse itself or to what extent it can be, uh, he or she can be a witness to circumstantial or corroborating evidence. So let me use an example. What about the trauma, <coughs> evident trauma of the survivor? Uh, would that be able to be taken into account as corroborating evidence? Uh, yes. It would need to be taken into account. And if I could mention, uh, Mr. Stewart, uh, these are the things that we're interested in, in following up on after the Royal Commission, uh, just to make sure that uh, everything is in place, because uh, certainly these are the things we're interested in. Yes, but you'll understand, Mr. Jackson, what, 
what we're interested in is, is how much room you have to move, as it were, to what extent you bound by the scriptures and to what extent you have flexibility to change your processes. That's right. That well, uh, may I mention... Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was going to say to Zona, would that be a convenient time for a lunch adjournment? Well, Mr Jackson, what did you want to say? Uh, I was just going to... Uh, to say, I thought we, that had already been established in the hearings, but if not, uh, certainly that's uh, something that we need to follow up on. Very well. Um, Mr Jackson, it's appropriate that we now take a break for lunch here. We'll come back at 2 o'clock Sydney time.